So I decided to start this morning with something a little bit light and loving and precious because I think we need as many reminders of our shared humanity and lightness and preciousness as we can get this week. So here goes. This is a list of responses that were given to a group of researchers when they asked four to eight-year-olds, what is love? So what is love out of the mouths of babes? When my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore, so my grandfather does, does it for her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. That's love. When someone loves you, the way they say your name is different. You just know your name is safe in their mouth. That's good, good response. Love is what makes you smile when you're tired. Love is when my mommy makes coffee for my daddy and she takes a sip before giving it to him to make sure it tastes okay. <laughs> Love is what's in the room with you at Christmas if you stop opening presents and listen. That's a big one. If you want to learn to love better, you should start with a friend you hate. These are four to eight-year-olds, I'm just going to remind you. Love is when you tell a guy you like his shirt and then he wears it every day. <laughs> love is like a little old woman and a little old man who are still friends even after they know each other so well. During my piano recital, I was on a stage and I was scared. I looked at all the people watching me and saw my daddy waving and smiling. He was the only one doing that. Love is when mommy gives daddy the best piece of chicken. Love is when your puppy licks your face even after you left him alone all day. I know my older sister loves me because she gives me all her old clothes and has to go out and buy new ones. <laughs> now that's love. When you love somebody, your eyelashes go up and down and little stars come out of you. And this is the last one. You really shouldn't say I love you unless you mean it. But if you mean it, you should say it a lot because people forget. Precious. But I bet when you heard this morning's scripture reading, love wasn't the first thing that came to your mind. I bet you didn't think, oh, Charlotte's going to preach on love. <laughs> because after all, Jesus was describing in this parable a pretty unloving scene. These unruly tenants who beat and stone and kill the landlord's messengers. The crowd responding out of anger and violence. It was kind of vicious stuff. And maybe like me, if you've heard that parable before, you kind of quickly assessed the passage in this way. God is the landowner and the Israelites are the tenants who reject God's messengers over and over and over again until God does the unthinkable and sends his son. And even then, the message and the messenger are rejected. So God is left with no other choice than to take the vineyard away from those tenants and give it to someone who will actually give him the fruits of the kingdom. I've even heard this interpretation that it, we Christians, or the Gentiles of Jesus' day, are the new tenants who will produce the harvest that God wants, which feels an awful lot like us patting ourselves on the back for something we didn't do. And that would be great if that's all there was to this parable, a nice, simple, easy to interpret story. But I've learned that the Bible always requires us to actually sit with a passage a little bit longer. Because scripture is this living, breathing thing, and it always has a little bit more to say to us. Besides, I recently heard it said that if you hear a parable and you feel vindicated or even comfortable, you've probably read it wrong. <laughs> so let's dig a little bit deeper. Immediately after Jesus tells the story, of the tenants beating, stoning, and killing the messengers, Jesus turns to the crowd and he says, so what 
will the owner of the vineyard do when he comes? Now I'm going to stop right there and ask you, what do you think that the owner of the vineyard would do when he comes? What would you do if you were the owner of the vineyard? The response of the crowd always tells us a lot about their mindset, their state of mind, or their state of well-being. And in this case, I think the crowd must have really been suffering. They must have been enduring something in their lives because their response surprised me. I certainly would have been angry, incensed, even a bit revolted by the tenant's response to what should happen, or, or to the, excuse me, to the crowd's response to what should happen to the tenants. But the veracity and the viciousness of their response still surprised me. When Jesus asked the question, what will the owners do? According to the crowd gathered there that day, the landowner will put those wretches to a miserable death and turn the vineyard over to someone who will produce the fruits. He will put those wretches to a miserable death. Now, despite how disturbing I found that impassioned answer, I think many people would share that response. They deserved it. They had it coming. People are inherently evil, so just get rid of them, an eye for an eye. But here's the thing, if God is the landowner in this parable, and he is, then regardless of who the tenant is, experience tells me that putting them to a miserable death is the last thing God would do. God is the exact opposite of that. God is relentless when it comes to loving us. God is the God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances. Let me tell you about one of God's wretches. Back in the 1700s, there was a man named John Newton. He was born in England to a, a very religious mother who died when he was seven. His father was very strict and was a sailor, and at age 11, took John with him to sea. There, John got into all kinds of trouble, carousing and drinking. He enlisted in the British Navy, but later tried to desert the Navy which earned him a whipping of a hundred lashes in front of 350 of his shipmates. John was humiliated. He was near death, so angry that he contemplated murdering the captain and taking his own life. But he recovered, and when he recovered, he began work on a slave ship. You've all seen the images in the movies and in books of what that kind of life must have been, and the kind of man John must have been to have worked on a slave ship. He didn't get along well with his shipmates. Apparently this was an issue for John. And they abandoned him in West Africa, set sail without him, left him there, where he was quickly taken in by a family of some prominence in West Africa who took him as a slave and mistreated him and abused him. Finally, John was rescued somehow, and he found himself aboard a ship on his way back to England, finally. But it was a sinking ship, literally. So John, who was not a religious man by any stretch of the imagination, prays out to God that he will just make it home. And immediately afterwards, the waves tilt the ship sideways, sliding the cargo in the hull over a gaping hole that stops the ship from taking on more water and saves the entire crew. Now John took this as a sign that God was with him, and he marks it as his moment of conversion to Christianity. Some years later, many years later, John became an Anglican priest, and he wrote, a number of hymns, one of which you know very well. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. 
It was a long and arduous journey for John to God, but as John Newton knew and wrote so poignantly, God never gives up on us. God's love is bigger and more forgiving and more compassionate and more patient than anything we can ever imagine. God's love is plenty big enough for all of us wretches in the world. It is a crazy big love. God never gives up on people. Now in these scant few verses that we heard this morning in, in the parable, Jesus is giving us the history of our amazing grace. The Bible shows us time and time again how God continually invites people into a new way of being. And the Old Testament in particular is packed full of stories of people turning away from God, doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord, rejecting the message, and God patiently waits for the next good king to rise up, patiently waits for the next humble servant to lead the way. It's a very common theme in the Old Testament. A new king rises to power and does evil. He reigns for 20, 30, 40 years, doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord, and God leaves them to it, leaves the people to let their lives unravel. They're at unrest until finally they call out to God and God is there. God delivers them over and over again. It happens in the Old Testament. Is it any wonder that it still happens today? What it tells us is that God is always near. In the midst of all the upheaval, of our human lives. We can be mired in the muck so deep, but all we have to do is call out to God and God is there. Did God get angry? Absolutely. But don't miss God's grace in the midst of the stories. Grace is just one of the ways that God shows us his crazy big love. There's a powerful illustration of this in the Old Testament book of Hosea. Hosea is a prophet of God, and he's instructed in the opening verses of the book of Hosea to do some pretty crazy stuff. God says to Hosea, I want you to go and marry a prostitute and have some children be born by her, to her, by other men. Are you with me? Okay. He, God says to Hosea that marrying a prostitute will be my way to illustrate to the people that they have been untrue to me, openly committing adultery against the Lord by worshiping other gods, he says. Okay, that's crazy. And what's more crazy is that Hosea did it. God said to him, even though she is adulterous, love her as I love the people of Israel, though, and I'm quoting, though they turn to other gods and are fond of raisin cakes. Okay, really, you just cannot make this stuff up. <laughs> Apparently, raisin cakes were what people offered to the gods of fertility, but it all sounds kind of crazy. God instructs Hosea to eventually buy her back. By the way, um, Hosea's wife's name is Gomer. I don't think that's really a name that's going to anytime soon make the top ten baby list, but you may consider it if any of you are expectant parents out there. So God instructs Hosea to eventually buy Gomer back for 15 pieces of silver and some barley. Again, I, I'm not making this up. This is Old Testament, goofy-sounding stuff. It sounds ludicrous, the story of Hosea and Gomer. But God loved Israel so much, there is no way that God was going to let the people go. It's the, it's the first time in the Bible that we see this sort of relationship of marriage, the relationship of God and Israel in terms of a marriage. And it kind of makes sense. It's kind of crazy. But as the story of Hosea goes, God would chastise the Israelites, then redeem them just as Hosea was to redeem Gomer and bring them back to be fully restored wholeheartedly reunited with God. People do what is evil, but then they cry out for God, and God delivers them. The prophet Hosea 
also told the people what was going to happen to them. He let them know there will be crime and false idols and arrogant leaders and political upheaval. Your monarchies will fail, he told them. You will be exiled, ridiculed, and punished. And after all of that, he said, you will be redeemed. At the end of the book of Hosea, God says so beautifully, I will not give vent to my blazing anger because I am God, not man. He knows our limitations so well. I will not give vent to my blazing anger because I am God, not man. I will heal their defection. I will love them freely. One version of the Bible says, I will love them lavishly. The message of Hosea is this. God has an enduring love for people. God is ridiculously patient. God is so forgiving. God's love is unconditional. And God has a crazy big love for sinful people like us. God never gives up on us. As Jesus stood among the crowds that day, saying, listen to another parable. It seemed an innocuous enough teaching, but I believe that it elicited such upset and anger because people focused on the evil of the tenants and not on the wideness of God's mercy. What we focus on grows. Do I want more anger by focusing on evil, or do I want more grace by focusing on love? I get to choose my response. In fact, I think that Jesus could have offered a follow-up question to the crowd that day. Jesus asks, what will the landowner do when he comes? And if the answer isn't, or if the answer is that he won't punish them, and in, in fact is going to do the opposite of putting those wretches to a miserable death, then the follow-up question might be, what should the tenant's response to God's mercy be? If God is so forgiving, so patient, so unconditional, if God does all of that for us, then shouldn't our response be just as big? Shouldn't our response to God's crazy love be crazy love? Yes, it should be. And God says as much. In John, 1 John 3.16, John writes, The way we came to know love is that he laid down his life for us, so we ought to lay down our lives for him, for others. Now that's crazy. That sounds crazy. That's crazy love. That's a crazy response. But our response is often not crazy, not even heartfelt. Francis Chan is a minister who wrote a book called Crazy Love. And in it, he writes, the God of the universe, the creator of nitrogen and pine needles, galaxies, and E minor. Isn't that just a great visual? The creator of nitrogen and pine needles, galaxies, and E minor loves us with a radical, unconditional, self-sacrificing love, he writes. And what is our typical response? We go to church, sing songs, and try not to cuss too much. Crazy big love deserves a response that's bigger than that. God set the bar high, but we are up to the task. We can forgive people who hurt us. We can heal broken relationships. We can bring peace to our corner of the world. We can care for those in need. We can fight for justice. We can care for this earth. We can sit with our brothers and sisters in pain. We can feed the hungry. We can honor the Sabbath. We can love our neighbor as we would love ourselves. We can lavish love on others. We can lavish love on our families, on our coworkers, on the people sitting in front and in back of you and around you in these pews. We can lavish our love on people who don't see eye to eye with us politically. We can lavish our love on people that we wouldn't want to spend time with. We can lavish love on others because it's been lavished 
on us. And if we think we're doing enough, we can do more. We can do better. Hosea illustrated for us that no one is beyond our capacity for forgiveness because no one sits outside of God's offer of forgiveness. No one is beyond our capacity to help, protect, shield, advocate for because no one sits outside of God's capacity to do those things. Crazy love deserves a response that is crazy. Crazy love begets crazy love. Crazy big love doesn't just tolerate. It isn't just being nice. It isn't pretending to accept others. Crazy big love is not a list of do's and don'ts. It is literally following Jesus and receiving God's love. That's how we truly experience the love that is being lavished on us. Not just know it intellectually or talk about it, but when we truly experience God's love, when we can truly experience the breadth and length and height and depth of God's love, when our response to love is love, when we respond to God's love for us by embodying that same love for others, that's how we truly experience the love that is offered and we receive it when we give it. We can choose not to return that love and God will love us anyway always inviting us back. God's love just keeps coming for us, patiently waiting for us to cry out, and then inviting us to love others as we have been loved, so that we might experience and share the fullness and the joy of this life. Amen.